Hello and welcome to India's World. The future of the Schengen zone of passport-free travel in Europe seems increasingly dismal. Many European Union countries want to prolong border controls for up to two years because of the Middle East refugee crisis. Up to now, six of the 26 countries in the Schengen area have reintroduced border controls for a period of six months. These countries are France, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Germany and Austria. Between them, Sweden, Germany and Austria accepted 90% of the 1 million plus refugees who arrived in Europe. Meanwhile, Hungary has fenced off its borders with Serbia, Croatia and Slovenia. The European Commission has said that it could agree to a suspension of border-free travel in the Schengen zone for up to two years. It has also claimed that nearly two-thirds of the immigrants entering the EU in the month of December alone were not eligible for asylum because they did not come from conflict zones. If border controls are allowed to remain for two years, many believe it would be unlikely that they would then be removed. A decision for extending the border controls is likely to take place latest by May this year, if not earlier. To discuss the future of the Schengen area in Europe, we have with us a very distinguished panel of experts. We have with us Ambassador Kamal Sibyl. He was India's Foreign Secretary and has served as India's Ambassador to Turkey, Egypt, France and Russia. We have with us Ambassador Dinka Khuller. He was India's Ambassador to Belgium, Luxembourg and the European Union. He was also Ambassador to Azerbaijan and Austria and Permanent Representative of India to UN offices and international organizations in Vienna. And we have with us Ambassador Shiv Shankar Mukherjee. He was India's Ambassador to Nepal and Egypt and High Commissioner to the South Africa and UK. So I welcome you gentlemen to this discussion. Ambassador Sibyl, let me begin with you. Why has the appetite of Europe for accommodating refugees and asylum seekers shrunk so severely and so suddenly? I think it's because of uh, a sudden influx of refugees, an uncontrolled influx of refugees, which, were, which was encouraged by the position the German Chancellor Merkel took in welcoming uh, up to 800,000 or a million uh, refugees, which gave a signal to all would-be refugees that if Germany, the, the principal country today in the European Union, had such a broad-minded and welcoming attitude uh, to refugees, that this was a golden chance uh, to get entry into the European Union. But what this has uh, really happened is that uh, smaller countries, uh, which don't have the kind of experience some of the major European countries have of dealing with the outside world uh, and are very conservative in nature and the societies are very homogenous. They have uh, been uh, opposed uh, uh, to this kind of uh, openness towards the refugees. But what is surprising is that even countries like Sweden and Norway and others, Sweden especially, which have always been extremely liberal, have begun to feel uh, the strains of uh, all these refugees coming in and with all the cultural and law and order problems that have arisen. But in short, I think it, is, it was, in a sense, a well-intentioned humanistic gesture by Chancellor Merkel, which was also mixed up with the economic calculations because in an aging society, they need younger, uh, they need immigration. That has backfired very badly and created a huge problem in Europe. So is it merely uh, an existential threat that some of the European countries feel because of the refugee influx, or is it also a security threat, especially after the terrorist attacks in Paris, the attack in uh, the, the killing in San Bernardino in California, and the uh, mass rape and uh, harassment accusations in Cologne, for which uh, Middle Eastern refugees and North African immigrants were blamed? I, I do think that there is a you know, wider uh, question which arises, which is both the factors, the refugees coming in yeah. and the terror, and the fact that Apparently, some of the people linked up with the Paris incident had come in through Greece so, and could travel freely in the Schengen zone. Uh, there is, in addition to it, the fact of the economic uh, situation. They have been going through the euro crisis. Uh, things don't, haven't recovered. In the meanwhile, you get one million more people to cope with in a year, apart from the money you're funding outside. A combination of all these factors, I think, is at work within the European Union and uh, when you don't see the benefits of the main benefit of the European Union being economic when you see that being frittered away uh, obviously politically it is risky for the leadership and the people. Uh, Shivshankar Mukherjee, do you agree with those that terrorism remains a big threat uh, for Europe because people believe that because of open borders terrorists have either already embedded amongst the refugees or will continue to embed in future with the refugees so that they can set up uh, Islamic fundamentalist cells, 
in in Europe and then attack European countries. Well, that is certainly a perception, and that perception is being uh, strengthened and fueled by the right wing parties uh, all across Europe. At a time like this, uh, one of the gainers in a political sense is always the hardliners and the and the, and the right wing parties, for whom immigration has always been an issue. Uh, on, on which they, they, they on, on their electoral planks. So if you have this combination, it's an explosive cocktail, this combination as both uh, Kamal and, and Dinkar pointed out, A, the unprecedented influx of refugees, which is showing, by the way, no signs of stopping. In January, I believe the figures are 35,000 Turkey to Greece, which is higher than, than the previous months. Then you combine that with this, this whole uh, atmosphere of being under a, a, a terrorist threat, uh, which, you know, uh, you attach that to the refugees, which are supposed to be part of that. And then you take the unemployment, uh, which is, I think, a huge problem, uh, why the refugee crisis is being called the biggest crisis since World War II. Spain, unemployment is 21 percent. Greece is 25 percent. And according to the European Commission figures, the unemployment figures for the young up to the age of 25 is actually double that. So you take this cocktail of joblessness uh, and, and, and the perception of terrorism and the unprecedented uh, influx and combine that with the already, uh, you know, the perception of immigration being a hot potato. And you have really a crisis which, uh, as your report said, you know, under the Schengen rules, you can extend exceptional uh, rules for exceptional circumstances by six months, which ends in May. The two years period is because you can you can extend that only yeah. three times more, which is two yeah. years yeah. in you know 2018. So there's a problem. But, but if if this uh, uh, Article 26 of Schengen Act, which allows two-year extension, is implemented, do you think that extending border controls for two years would uh, fracture Europe irreparably? I think so. In a sense, it will. But before I answer that, I will say this is a terrorism issue. Is is nothing new to Europe after all. Much before this problem occurred of a massive influx of refugees, you had terrible terrorist attacks in the 80s in France. Then you had the attacks in London, in Madrid, elsewhere. So Europe has lived with terrorism. Uh, the only fear now is that uh, with lots of Europeans having gone to fight alongside the Daesh in uh, Iraq and Syria, uh, their fear is that they will come back. Uh, and uh, because a lot of them are European origin and Christian converts that they can sow mayhem in the country. So the terrorism issue has become uh, more uh, difficult to handle because of the Paris attacks yeah. and this but and that. But it's the problem they have been living with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a long time. Insofar as uh, the, you see, the whole idea, the Europe, there are two things in the European uh, concept. One, of course, is that Europe is truly a union in the sense that they really pool all their sovereignty and create a supra-state. And the other is the countries which want to retain their national yeah. uh, sovereignties uh, in, in several critical areas, like Britain has yeah. done. So yeah. there's always a tension. And, but one of the uh, couple of things which were absolutely essential for larger European unity was a common currency and borderless movement of people within the European Union. Like in a country like India, you can travel from one yeah. part to another. Now, if they start exerting, exercising yeah. border controls, yeah. Yeah. on a prolonged basis, and if they are going yeah. to live with unrest in the Middle East yeah. and the threat of terrorism, I think the idea of Europe will okay. greatly suffer. All right. We need to take a break at this point. We'll be back with you in a bit. Stay with us. Don't go away. Welcome back. We're discussing the future of the Schengen passport free zone in Europe. Uh, Ambassador Dinka Kuller, Turkey had agreed last November that it will stem the flow of refugees from Turkey to Greece and then on uh, to, to Europe, uh, but it needed aid. So European Union offered it 3 billion euros as aid, plus several other political concessions. So why is it that Turkey is unable to stop people smugglers using Turkey as a staging post for going to Greece? Well, it's uh, simply supply and demand factor. The Turks said at the outset that this is quite insufficient to meet the requirements for maintaining the refugees because they are get, continue to get an inflow. The numbers are very substantial. And on the other hand, there is movement out because of the attraction of uh, Europe to these countries. Frankly, you know, it's very difficult to, there's a very thin line between refugees and migrants, particularly in economic migrants, particularly in cases like this, 
where they are already displaced. Turkey is not their resident. Turkey, they have been moved out of their place of residence. The incentive to move further away, uh, the disincentive of moving, for instance, is not there because you were already out of your home. And the economic attractions at a time when you can come in as a refugee uh, from a, a war zone, uh, I don't blame the Turks entirely. It's, you can't attribute the blame to them. They may be turning a blind eye, but uh, I don't think the Turks can be entirely blamed for this. It is the refugees themselves okay. who are interested okay. in moving. Ambassador Bukhaji, you said earlier that the number of uh, uh, refugees going to Europe or migrants is actually increasing. Now, people had uh, thought that with the onset of winter and rougher season winter, the number would go down. Why is it still increasing? Well, I think the factors that fuel uh, these, this refugee stream into Europe haven't ended. I mean, you know, the, if, you, if you look at the conflict situation all across West Asia, and please remember the number of refugees from Syria, according to European figures, are just 20%. There's the normal refugee stream which has been accentuated because Europe itself is in turmoil, you know, at the borders. Uh, which, which represents 60 to 70 percent of, of the refugees uh, coming into Europe. So uh, there seems to be, in fact, uh, no let up in the refugee stream. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the, the summit meeting in February that is, that is going to be crucial for Europe. Uh, and Angela Merkel, remember, is now facing regional elections where hard, hardline opinion is going against her. I don't think they will do, be able to do much uh, okay. beyond offering more money to Turkey, offering more money to Lebanon, and extending it for another six months. Okay. Well, Sybil, why, why do European Union countries blame Greece for the refugee influx into Europe? And why hasn't the European Union kept its part of the bargain with Greece when they said that they will resettle the refugees who are being held in uh, Greece to the extent they're being held there? Only, you know, out of some 160,000, only 400, 414 have been re, uh, relocated. So why blame uh, Greece alone? Well, I think firstly it is uh, Turkey which is uh, not really willing uh, to actively prevent uh, these uh, refugees from moving mm. out. Otherwise, they'll be saddled with them more and more. Uh, so, it is in their interest to let them go. And then, as you said, they can bargain with Europe for concession. And Greece, with so many islands and many of them very close to the Turkish shores, uh, is the easiest point of access for refugees coming through Turkey to Europe. And uh, from Greece, therefore, they enter the rest of the European Union. Now, Greece doesn't have the administrative apparatus and other uh, requirements to deal with such a large influx of refugees. So the criticism of Greece is that uh, they let these people go into the rest of the European Union and don't uh, assume their responsibility because Greece can, as it is in a terrible economic crisis, on top of that, if it if was to become the staging point and the collection point for all these refugees for a long period of time, they won't be able to cope with it. Added to this, an island here is that the Europe has not been able to agree on the quota system that, okay, from Greece, how many of them will go to which country? Exactly. They tried it, but it didn't, it didn't work. So the whole system is in a flux. The optimists say that the European Union has faced such problems and the whole, whole uh, European Union concept was such a difficult one to put, in, put into practice on the ground and they found solutions. And they'll be able to find solutions to this, but I'm not too optimistic that they'll be able to find solutions okay. because the societal reactions in these countries, even the very liberal ones, is very strong. Uh, Ambassador Kula, given uh, what uh, Mr. Sibyl has said, why then are European leaders asking Greece to uh, uh, build holding camps for up to 300,000 refugees? How can Greece agree to this proposal when it is clear that the European uh, Union countries are unwilling to take those refugees? Why should it uh, hold them there? 300,000 is a huge number for a country like Greece. I, I totally agree. I don't see why the Turkish should take the entire load. They are the eastern perimeter. They're next I, to... I'm Greece. You Greece, mean. sorry. Uh, Greece should take the load. Uh, they are the eastern perimeter. Turkey find, people from Turkey find it easy to get there. But uh, uh, the economic conditions prevailing there and the non-guarantee that they will be able to the, go to the other countries, because particularly the East Europeans are showing no inclination of accepting any formula of yeah. redistribution. Uh, the Greeks, I think, are in this case well within their rights to say that why should we take the load entirely ourselves? It's easier for us but, to let them go. But why are they being blamed? I wonder, I don't really have an answer for that, but they have to find some scapegoat. The Italians and the Greeks are the easiest uh, to find. Nowadays, it's the Greeks who are the, uh, on the extreme. And the fact of it is, 
that you see Greece doesn't have any natural border or land border with uh, a Schengen country. Uh, so what happens is they're releasing them into the Balkans, which is a bit of a free for all. And that is why further problems are arising. Uh, we also have a situation where the Greeks are getting people from the northern border. Macedonia is being used as an entry point uh, into uh, Greece. Uh, I don't think the Greeks are to blame. I think the entire Europeans have to get their act together if they want uh, this to survive. The euro has already been under threat for some time and this is their second major uh, exercise of European unity, the Schengen. Okay. Can an intermediate solution, Ambassador Mukherjee, be that you exclude Greece from the Schengen area? Keep the Schengen, rest of the Schengen area intact, but exclude Greece. Because what Greece is doing is registering refugees and then uh, letting, letting them, them go. go. Now, is this a real possibility? Actually, the threat has already been made openly. The, at the recent Amsterdam meeting in, in, in sideline conversations uh, publicly to the press, a number of ministers have threatened Greece with uh, being virtually excluded uh, from the European Union's various uh, uh, institutions if it doesn't fall into line. Uh, so, and Greece insists, Greece insists that it is being made the scapegoat for all sorts of wrong reasons. There is a European law that any refugee must seek asylum in the country in which he, ent uh, the country in which he enters Europe, which means Greece and Italy as far as the refugee crisis is concerned. Mm. And both these countries insist that, look, uh, that, that uh, with this unprecedented influx of refugees, yeah. that is absolutely absurd. You must play your role. Now, the rest of Europe, uh, as Kamal pointed out, is not playing its role. Yeah. It is not agreeing to quotas. I, I it, is, it is under all sorts of pressure. Yeah. So there you have it. It's a, I think the intermediate you're talking about is going to be uh, sought at this mid-February meeting, meeting, which is going to be a sort of a ragged extension hoping that the future will bring right. some kind of solution. Okay, we need to take a break again at this point. We'll be back again in a bit. Don't go away, stay with us. Welcome back, we're discussing the future of the Schengen area. Uh, Mr. Kuller, one of the uh, proposals for the European Commission is to create a new European border and coast guard. And they're saying that this European uh, border and coast guard force would then be deployed uh, to countries most vulnerable to refugee influx. They will guard the coast. They will uh, be an effective way of preventing refugees from coming. But my question to you is, should we be looking at these short-term uh, preventive measures or should, should Europe be looking at the causes of the refugee in, uh, in, influx and address the permanent causes of uh, refugees coming in rather than saying that we'll have a more effective force which will sort of prevent these people from entering Greece or Italy or wherever? Indeed, they should be looking at oh, what are the long-term solutions rather than short-term because uh, they have had, after all, the Frontex has existed. It's not worked very well. Yeah. Uh, but having a coast guard or border guard or whatever, the experience of movement of refugees or illegal immigrants into Europe has proved over the years, and not just recently, that these have not acted as a disincentive and they have not worked. People have kept coming in. Uh, so the Europeans, you know, by setting up more institutions that don't work, for instance, neither does the Schengen information system, which was supposed to provide details across from each country to the other on any entries, that they themselves admit hasn't worked. So when their existing institutions, whether it is Frontex <coughs> or SIS, haven't worked, uh, do they expect new institutions to work? And uh, where is it going to come from? They need funds for all this. Uh, remember, if they have to establish border controls, that's a huge exercise in uh, financing. Uh, you know, most of these are now disused posts uh, lying at the border, never in, um, never in use, for, at least for the last 20 years, as far as we know. And you have to re-establish them. That's going to cost money. Yeah. And this coincides with the fact that once you institute the controls, the economic advantage of freedom of movement of goods and personnel is going to add to the costs to the economy in any case. So yeah. they're going to be hit both ways, uh, costs on the demand and supply side. Okay. Uh, well, Sibyl, uh, something very strange is happening. Why are some European countries seizing uh, jewellery and other valuables from the refugees saying that they must pay for the costs of their stay? Uh, under the proposed uh, law in Denmark, for example, if a refugee is carrying more than uh, 1,000 pounds equivalent in krone or krona, whatever it is called, uh, they will be seized and the only exceptions are your wedding rings and your uh, other items of sentimental value you would be allowed to keep. Now, Denmark has come under criticism uh, from international bodies, but it turns out that Germany and Switzerland have been doing this all along, saying that, look, if you've got the money, 
then why should you live off uh, uh, our state exchequer? So they seize their uh, uh, cash over a certain amount uh, and then uh, say, oh, all right, if you're in, then we will pay for you now. But if you're, if you're coming with money, we will not. We will take that money or we'll turn you back. Well, from a strictly uh, practical point of view, uh, what Denmark and others have done could be justified on the ground that they're going to spend a lot of money on uh, integrating uh, the uh, refugees, on their education, on their social security, medical training, whatever else, give them jobs. And therefore, if they can contribute a little bit uh, to the expenses that will be incurred, there's nothing wrong with it. And uh, these are the countries with a particular kind of mindset, which maybe in the East, we look at these things a bit uh, uh, differently. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it does show that, uh, you know, compassion is limited and that you are taking full advantage of the misery of these poor people and whatever little resources they have, you're taking them away. And in that sense, uh, you are, your attitude is that of an accountant rather than uh, what they talk about, European values of compassion and democracy and human rights and stuff like that. So I think Europe is facing, facing a crisis. Not only that, the other things that have happened, uh, which are, uh, in a sense, totally contrary to the, uh, Europe's uh, uh, unique selling point, uh, of uh, having become, in, in a sense, a role model for the rest of the world in terms of values. I think the, the refugee crisis has brought out into the open uh, a lot of the undercurrents of uh, racism uh, and, uh, and uh, lack of uh, generosity mm -hmm. also, uh, and uh, intolerance, which in any case, which I must say, and I must, must make that point, is far, far in excess of all the debate we are having in India about intolerance. All right. Uh, uh, Ambassador Kuller, therefore, uh, shouldn't these countries make a distinction between uh, refugees fleeing conflict zones and migrants who may be coming to settle in Europe with the, all their savings? And it is all right to tell these migrants who are not escaping conflict zones and if they're coming with large amounts of money that, look, why should our taxpayers pay for you? You want to come in, you want us to uh, uh, sort of see whether you should be given asylum or not, but, and we'll pay for you meanwhile, but we will take the excess cash that you're carrying. After all, foreign exchange controls exist in every country. Well, uh, as Ambassador Sewell pointed out, they're already doing it. Uh, the reality is also that they are trying to identify so-called safe countries from which you will not get asylum in any case. I mean, some of the North African countries have been identified. But uh, I did say earlier that there's a very thin line between migrants and refugees. Uh, but the clear migrants category, I think, uh, will end up not, it's already started and will be, I have a feeling it will become Europe-wide that they will be identified and said they will be uh, sought resources from them to give them asylum. Okay, now let me ask you this, Ambassador Mukherjee, since you're a high commissioner in the UK, there's a referendum looming uh, right. over the British public on whether to remain in the European Union or exit. Uh, the European Union. Do you think the prospect of influx of refugees will weigh heavily on the minds of the British voter if such a referendum comes to pass? Well, there are already press reports indicating that it will. And uh, the battle lines are drawn in Britain. Uh, the other basic, uh, the other very huge uh, sort of elephant in the room is the fact that Scotland has made it very clear that if Britain leaves the European Union, Scotland leaves Britain. Uh, so yes, the, the crisis and its, its repercussions certainly will affect the referendum in, in Britain. And the, uh, if you look at all this together, the possibility of Schengen getting shattered, Britain leaving the EU and the economic stagnation that Europe is going through, if you consider just this, the future of the European Union and all that it stands for looks in the short term at least pretty dim. So will Schen Schengen be shattered, yes or no, because then we are running out of time? I think they will try and save it because, as was rightly said, the cost of that in terms of the European project yeah. is very, would be very severe. Okay, Master Kula? I think they'll find some interim solution. They can't have it. They can't have the breakups. And that interim can't be, you know, leave Greece out? I don't think no. so. Okay. All right. We've really run out of time. I'd like to thank all of you, Ambassador Shivshankar Mukherjee, Ambassador Dinka Kula, Ambassador Kaval Sibyl for participating in this discussion. That's all we have for you today. We'll be back again as usual next week. Till then, goodbye and thanks for watching India's work.